Good afternoon. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Andy Cutchins. I'm a director of the Russia and Eurasia program here. And um, I'm very happy uh, to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Sergei Markadonov, who has now been a visiting scholar here at the, the Center for more than three years. Yeah. It's hard to believe. Yeah. It's one of the, it's a long visit. Um, and it's been a great yeah, visit, fruitful. extremely fruitful. They've contributed a tremendous amount to uh, the work of the Russia Eurasia program and to CSIS, and, and more broadly to the uh, the, the Washington uh, community with interests in Russia, and particularly in the Caucasus and and uh, states around states around the Caucasus. It's hard to believe that uh, in about seven months, um, the uh, the Winter Olympic Games of 2014 in Sochi uh, will start. I remember uh, almost, I think it was seven years ago, when Mr. Putin went to Guatemala City and uh, uh, surprisingly, I think, convinced the International Olympic Committee uh, to award uh, the Games to Sochi. Uh, I think it uh, was one of his major achievements um, and symbolically quite important, I think, uh, for him and for Russia, kind of symbolizing Russia's return uh, back uh, as a recovering and uh, resurgent uh, power in the world. Um, now, there was a joke going around at the time that Mr. Putin arrived with a lot more luggage in Guatemala City than he left with. <laughs> but uh, all joking aside, I mean, it really was a, a quite, a, quite, an, quite an achievement. And we're not going to be talking really about the uh, the logistics of getting all of the uh, equipment and uh, hotels and uh, uh, sites ready for the games today, um, which is quite a challenge in and of, in and of itself. Uh, but uh, we're going to be talking really about some of the security challenges to holding the games in Sochi. Uh, I don't think uh, ever has a winter or summer Olympic game, games been held uh, in a place with so much, with so close in proximity to a region, the Northern Caucasus, uh, which is so rife with conflict, instability, uh, and uh, acts of violence, uh, many of them terrorist, terrorist acts. So the, the security challenges for these games uh, is obviously mon monumental, and uh, I look forward to hearing what Sergei has to say about this kind of broader geopolitical uh, and security environment uh, under which the games will be taking place. So, Sergey, it's uh, great to have you uh, with us here and uh, look forward to your presentation today. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Andy. Just today, it would be my second presentation. The, the first one took place a couple of hours ago in Heritage Foundation. That one was devoted to the Eurasian Union and Russian desires in this uh, project. But now uh, let me uh, move a little bit to another direction to uh, Sochi and uh, problems of ethnopolitics and security around uh, the uh, upcoming Olympics. Uh, just uh, Andy uh, mentioned uh, the uh, session of uh, International Olympic Committee in Guatemala uh, in 2007. Those times I was just in Abkhazia when I firstly heard about the final decision of this committee and understood that it would be a good topic uh, for uh, my uh, investigations. Uh, of course, uh, the next February, uh, Sochi uh, would be the host of uh, the Winter Olympic Games. Uh, those Olympic Games uh, will be the first Russian-hosted Olympics since the uh, dissolution of USSR. By the way, the idea of uh, Olympic Games in Sochi was discussed in the Soviet times, in the late of Soviet times. But after the dissolution of the uh, Soviet Union and for the first years of the existence of Russia, this topic was put aside because some uh, more important topics were on the table than Sochi. But finally, uh, International Olympic uh, Committee made its uh, choice and Sochi uh, will be uh, the host city of uh, Winter Olympics. Uh, those Olympics, uh, and Andy is absolutely right, is considered like a symbolic importance event. 
just today, uh, the Olympic Games are much more than only sport events. In 2008, in Beijing, China proved uh, its international aspirations and desire to be superpower. Or in 1972, Germany tried to demonstrate that it radically changed its image after Nazis. Uh, of course, uh, you know, um, taking into account the context of the Munich Olympic Games, uh, this attempt was uh, failed, or uh, maybe not completely, but partially taken into account uh, terrorist attack. But anyway, it was attempt. In uh, Moscow of uh, 1980, originally games uh, conceived like a demonstration of detente, demonstration of Razryatka, with the West, of course, Afghanistan changed a little bit, uh, this uh, conceiving, original conceiving, but anyway, it was conceived uh, in this way. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, uh, Russia tries to demonstrate its recovery, its return to the major league of international policy, and those games are extremely important personally for Vladimir Putin. Now, we are not discussing, uh, is it right, is it wrong, to consider Russia as a returning power to the major league, but it's a perception shared not only by Russian officials, but the uh, Russian society also. Uh, it's a kind of a challenge, because uh, the first Winter Games will be held in subtropical climate. I especially clarified the situation, because it was kind of discussion with my colleagues. They claimed Torino in Italy, like the first city hosted uh, the uh, Winter Olympic Games, but uh, there is no uh, consensus among geographers on Torino, because on some uh, reasons uh, Torino belongs to subtropical climate, but uh, in terms of rains and winter weather, no. This is why Sochi could be considered like the unique uh, space, uh, the uh, space uh, uh, of uh, Winter Olympics in the subtropical zone. And uh, don't forget that uh, Sochi uh, has been a reputation of the Russian summer capital city. Because Vladimir Putin, Dmitry Medvedev, and uh, other representatives of uh, the Russian leadership uh, tend to spend their vacation in Sochi. And this place is uh, also important in terms of decision-making concerning both the Caucasus and global things. Let's remember the uh, trilateral meeting on Nagorno-Karabakh and some other things. This is why Sochi is so uh, important. But uh, climate aside, however, Sochi faces a number of more difficult challenges. Now they are enlisted. First one is uh, the instability in the North Caucasus and challenge of terrorism from this territory. The Circassian issue having a particular importance in the context, in the context of history of the Russian uh, penetration and expansion in this region. The Georgia-Russian bilateral relations, Russian policy towards the de facto Abkhaz Republic, because in the West many observers tend to consider Abkhazia like puppet figure of Russia, but in reality on the ground situation is much more complicated. And there are many contradictions in the bilateral relations between a big Russia and small Abkhazia, small Abkhaz de facto state. And last not least, uh, the dynamics in uh, the Krasnodar region. You know that uh, leader of this region, Alexander Tkachev, governor of this region, is um, one of uh, public figures of the federal level. It's, um, he is not only a uh, governor of uh, the territory like Krasnodar. And taking into account strategic importance of uh, Krasnodar region and status of uh, summer or informal uh, capital city of Sochi, the role of Alexander Tkachev and his statements is uh, very important. And I'm going to touch uh, particularly this role in my presentation. Unlike uh, recent Olympic uh, host cities such as Beijing, London, or Vancouver, uh, Sochi is uh, very close to the hot spots of the uh, Russian uh, Federation. I mean here, uh, the North Caucasus is the most turbulent region of the Russian Federation. Sochi is 100 kilometers away Karachay, Cherkessia, and it's uh, about 200 kilometers away kabardino balkaria you know that in the early 90s, uh, Kabardino-Balkaria was called as a sleeping beauty of the Caucasus. 
Nowadays, it's incorrect because uh, in the period between 2010-2012, uh, Kabardino-Balkaria held the third uh, rate in so-called terrorist competition in uh, the North Caucasus. Even uh, winning this competition uh, with Chechnya. It's interesting that uh, data of 2012 uh, uh, demonstrated a decrease of the number of terrorist attacks practically everywhere in the North Caucasus. The one exception was in Gushetia. Even in Dagestan, leader of terrorist attacks in the North Caucasus since 2005, the number of terrorist attacks decreased in 15% in 2012. Many uh, reasons, many prerequisites for it, but anyway, till nowadays, the North Caucasus still uh, keeps uh, turbulency and uh, it's uh, considered like a potential threat, potential danger for Olympic Games. Don't forget that in 2007, uh, one of terrorist uh, structures of the North Caucasus uh, underground uh, Dagestani Vilayat claimed to attack Olympic objects in Sochi. And uh, nowadays, uh, Dagestani Vilayat is uh, the most powerful terrorist structures in the North Caucasus. Because uh, taking aside Chechnya, the uh, most uh, or the strongest operation, counter terrorist operation, was provided by the Russian troops or forces of interior just against the Dagestani Vilayat. It's a part of the uh, Caucasian Emirate, but it's impossible to consider Caucasian Emirate like CPSU or other vertical structures. It's kind of network. And uh, uh, different uh, cells of this network uh, behave in accordance of their own strategy, tactics. And this is why it's uh, so hard to make any prognosis or uh, predictions on the future development of uh, those structures, like uh, the Caucasus Emirate or uh, Dagestani Vilayat. Uh, today, the North Caucasus breeds instability beyond the region itself. It's also necessary to understand. And by the way, uh, Dagestani Vilayat was engaged in uh, bombings in Moscow metro attack on Nevsky Express, a special railway between Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, that is fort of Damodedovo International Airport, one of the biggest uh, transportation hub in Moscow. Uh, the Circassian issue, uh, the second uh, important question, uh, I try to consider it separately uh, from the general context of the uh, North Caucasus. Of course, uh, in the uh, period of uh, late 90s and especially since the first half of 2000s, uh, nationalism was replaced as a leading political discourse in the North Caucasus by radical Islamism or politicized Islamism. It's more correct because politicized Islamism have different faces. It's not restricted by Salafi activities. Let's see on Ramzan Kadyrov. He is also politicized Islamist, but pro-Russian, loyal to Vladimir Putin personally. But anyway, he is not champion or provider of secular policy, of course, in the territory of Chechnya. Or another example, Sufi Muslims in Dagestan. They are not also providers of uh, secular policy. They uh, make very actively on the area of Islamization. This Islamization is very different from uh, Salafi activities or jihadism, but anyway, it's also part of the picture of politicized Islamism. And politicized Islamism became uh, the leading uh, discourse leading political discourse in the uh, Caucasus. But it doesn't mean that nationalism was abolished completely. We could speak about uh, new nationalism. New nationalism uh, which uh, doesn't appeal directly to separation from Russia, but uh, which is active in terms of uh, interpretations of history, or uh, prerogatives, discussion of, on uh, regional prerogatives of the original local powers. And uh, we have now in uh, the North Caucasus two types or two phases of new nationalism. One of them is uh, represented by Ramzan Kadyrov. It's uh, the practice of uh, privatization of republic by uh, one uh, person and political group. Uh, 
close to him. And uh, other uh, case is extremely different. It uh, relates to grassroots activity. It's multi-faced. I mean here a Circassian issue. Nowadays, it's kind of myth to uh, consider a Circassian issue like a consequence of preparation to the Olympic Games. Of course, Sochi itself has historical importance for Circassians, both in Russia and in diaspora, because in 1961, uh, Midjlis, was um, provided in Sochi. It was attempt to uh, resist to the expansion of the Russian Empire. It was attempt to create something, uh, something similar or something looking like proper state, because proper state of Circassia it's not reality. Of course, it's kind of discovery of the British diplomats. By the way, I've prepared a special quote of one British uh, diplomat, David Urquhart, if you would have some questions, of course. But anyway, it was an attempt to create proper state to uh, be more active, to uh, resist the Russian imperial expansion. Uh, but in uh, 1864, uh, Gbaade, nowadays it's Krasnaya Poliana, beloved place of vacations of Vladimir Putin and Dmitry Medvedev, was the first battle, of, sorry, was the last place of last battle of the Caucasian War. After this battle, um, fourth son of uh, Nicholas I, Russian Emperor Mikhail Nikolaevich, provided the military parrot on the Krasnaya Poliana, and it, uh, one of the consequences of uh, the finish of Caucasian War was uh, emigration, or outflow of uh, Circassians from the uh, Caucasian region. And uh, some uh, historians, uh, but more journalists, uh, tend uh, now to consider those events like genocide. And you know that in May 2011, the Georgian parliament recognized uh, alleged genocide of Circassians. Uh, it's interesting, by the way, that uh, the first declaration of uh, genocide recognition was done within the framework of the Russian Federation. Now it's completely forgotten. In 1992, the parliament of kabardino balkaria adopted a special law on the recognition of genocide. But in 1996, another Republican parliament of Adegea adopted a... Uh, address to the federal an address uh, to the federal power to recognize uh, genocide of Circassians. And in 1994, President Yeltsin, with no recognition of genocide, begged a pardon for the uh, Russian uh, policy for uh, atrocities, damages uh, uh, taken uh, place in the period of uh, Caucasian War. But it would be uh, wrong to uh, restrict the problem to discussion on genocide, its recognition and uh, history. Uh, the Circassian question could be characterized in a more correct way like Circassian questions. Because uh, in different uh, Adygean entities of the Russian Federation, there are four entities in Russia with Adygean population. kabardino balkaria Karachay, Circassia, uh, Krasnodar Krai, and uh, uh, Adygea. Um, uh, every, uh, those entities have their own uh, agenda. In kabardino balkaria uh, the problem of uh, self-governing and problem of land disputes is uh, the more topical the most topical. In uh, the context of Karachay Circassia, the most important problem for Circassian minority, unlike uh, kabardino balkaria where Circassians are in majority, uh, Circassians in Karachay Circassia uh, suffer from their underrepresentation in the power, in the Republican level power. This is why any appointments within uh, the Republican administration are rather sensitive for uh, different ethnic groups. In the case of Adegea, the most important problem is repatriation. This problem has become more topical after the uh, civil war in Syria. You know that uh, there is a uh, Adegean population in Syria. Estimates are rather different between uh, 30,000 to 120,000. You know that uh, in the censuses of Syria, as well as in the Turkish Republic, there were no special criteria like ethnicity, only religion uh, background, but not, not ethnicity. And don't forget about uh, intermarriages between Arabs, Kurds, and Circassians. 
This is why what criteria of identification uh, do you apply? And uh, the number uh, and estimate of your number would depend on the criteria used for uh, the identification of this person or that person. Anyway, there is a problem uh, which is so topical, and um, Circassians uh, from Syria addressed uh, about seven times to the Russian uh, parliament, to the Russian government, to consider this problem. This problem is not so simple, taking into account a variety of challenges existing in uh, the North Caucasus, ethnic tensions, growing Islamism, and so on. But anyway, uh, Russia experienced some uh, more or less successful um, uh, attempts for repatriation. First of all, in this context, I wish to mention the experience of repatriation of uh, Adiks or Circassians from Kosovo in 1999. Uh, they were more or less uh, successfully adopted and integrated. In Adigea, only some families left this republic for Germany and Turkey, but uh, most of them uh, till nowadays uh, have been existing in this uh, territory. I think the uh, problem of uh, Russia's absence of clear position on this topic. We could agree or disagree with the position of uh, the Turkish Republic on the Armenian genocide, on issues of uh, Kurds, or uh, problems uh, related to, to Greeks or Assyrians. But anyway, there is an interpretation, there is a model, explanation model of the government. In case of Russia, we have. Uh, we have seen keeping silence as the uh, best option for uh, this uh, discussion and this topic. I am not sure that it's uh, the best option for this uh, issue. By the way, uh, speaking about Circassian movement, a couple of uh, last but no least uh, points. This movement or movements, unlike uh, Salafis and Jihadis, uh, are nonviolent. It's, it's necessary to understand, it's uh, very important. And uh, there is a bunch of different attitudes to the Russian Federation. Some of organizations, especially Adige Hase in Krasnodar Krai or Adige, are engaged in the cooperation with the uh, local governments and uh, federal government uh, in issues of repatriation, discussion of quotas, and so on. Some of them are more uh, radical, and, uh, of course, uh, speaking about diaspora attitudes, we need to take into account such phenomenon as uh, remote nationalism. It's not unique in the Circassian case. Uh, the same uh, cases uh, could be uh, described if we would speak about Armenian development, uh, de uh, development of Armenian diaspora or Jewish diaspora and, and, and so on. Uh, Sochi is a part of the Russian-Georgian relationship. Uh, practically immediately after the uh, decision of International Olympic Committee, officials of Georgia uh, tried to discuss the perspective of boycott of the Olympic Games, comparing uh, Sochi Olympic Games with uh, Afghanistan, situation in 1979 in, with uh, Moscow for 1980. But just recently, a uh, new government of Georgia, uh, which uh, won elections uh, in uh, previous October, uh, promoted the uh, Georgian participation. The National Committee of Georgia supported the participation of the Georgian delegation for the Olympic Games. Till nowadays, uh, Russian and Georgian normalization processes, a process is uh, maybe not so successful. It's not a success story, of course. We could uh, note only uh, some steps towards each other, like opening of the Russian market for wines, for mineral waters, or uh, facilitation in the checkpoint Kazbegi Verknilars on the military Georgian road, Vajena Gruzinskaya Daroga. It, uh, it's a border, uh, it's a North Ossetian part of the Russian-Georgian border. But the uh, Georgian participation in the Olympic Games could be also considered like one of the steps towards each other. Because nowadays the problem of Abkhazia and South Ossetia couldn't be considered like a real ground for compromise. Because uh, views on those topics are completely different. And don't forget about uh, more actors 
in this problem. This problem is not a uh, two-colored issue between Russia and Georgia. Don't forget about Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia. And now let me uh, turn to uh, Abkhazia and the Russian um, Abkhaz partnership. Uh, I am repeating once again, in the West, many people tend to consider Abkhazia like puppet figure of Russia, forgetting about very complicated dynamics of a Russian um, Abkhaz bilateral relations, like uh, blockade of Abkhazia in the late 90s, uh, some uh, attempts of Russia to put Georgia and Abkhazia together, project of Evgeny Primakov of the common state, and so on, so on. This, uh, Politics uh, was not eternal after the, uh, or permanent after the USSR uh, demise in 1991. Um, nowadays, Abkhaz people and Abkhazian leadership, of course, enjoy uh, the protection from the Russian side. Many people in Abkhazia really believe that Georgian issue is over. Now it's not in question uh, in agenda. Because nowadays, uh, Abkhazia is protected by the Russian militaries. But uh, this situation um, closing one set of the problems opened another one. And uh, nowadays, uh, people in Abkhazia, especially opposition, it's, it's uh, irony uh, that uh, Raul Khajimba, the uh, leading opponent of the current president of Abkhazia, in uh, 2004 was supported by Russia as a successor of Vladislav Arzenba, the first de facto president of Abkhazia. But currently, Raul Khadjumba is a leader of opposition who is so critical to the uh, current leadership of Abkhazia. And um, he uh, repeats from time to time, uh, we need to develop our own security structure, not relying completely on Moscow, because Moscow has uh, uh, its own interests. It, it, it's normal, of course. Each country has and provides uh, its own interests. It's not know-how of Russia or United States or any other countries. And of course, uh, Abkhaz independence is not uh, recognized by the most uh, of uh, countries, but it uh, doesn't deny uh, presence or existence of uh, proper interests on the Abkhaz side. Uh, they are concerning, uh, first and foremost, by the penetration of the Russian big business. Some desires of Russia to make discoveries of oil in the Black Sea. It's, it's, it's a problem. It's not coincidence that previous year, President of Abkhazia, Alexander Nkvab, who is loyal to Russia, of course, rejected the project of road building between Cherkesk and Suhumi. Concerning about ecology, environmental protection, and so on, but we uh, understand that uh, the most important concern of Abkhaz is demography. In the Soviet Georgia, they compose 17% of the total population. It was data of 1989, three years before the conflict with Georgia. But Russia is a little bit bigger than Georgia. And uh, migration of uh, re relatives, Circassians, Abaza people from the North Caucasus, even ethnic Russians, could be also treated like demographic challenge for Abkhazia. And in this context, uh, Sochi is uh, considered uh, on the one side as uh, maybe benefit, but on another side as a concern, because uh, we have, I'm repeating once again, deal with the asymmetric partnership between Abkhazia and Russia. And the difference of scales Weights is so visible in Abkhazia. This is why Abkhaz were uh, rather concerned about the appointment of Alexander Tkachev as a special envoy in Abkhazia, by the way. Now let me turn to Alexander Tkachev, the next hero. Uh, Krasnodar Krai has a strategic importance for uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, first of all, in terms of population, Krasnodar Krai is the third area in Russia after Moscow and Moscow region. You know that Moscow as a capital city and Moscow region are different constituencies according to the Russian constitution. There are some plans to unite them, but it's only plans or uh, drafts for discussion. Uh, the total population of Krasnodar uh, Krai is uh, roughly 5.5 million people. And uh, this territory is interesting to uh, migrants from there former USSR. Uh, today, Armenians uh, are the second ethnic group in uh, Krasnodar Krai. Uh, 
different estimates of uh, population, but uh, about uh, half a million people. Georgians, people from the North Caucasus, and, and so on. And uh, of course, uh, Krasnodar Krai uh, is uh, the only territory of Russia which has access to the Black Sea shore after the loss of Sebastopol and Crimean Peninsula. And who knows, maybe uh, Novorossiysk would be considered like the, uh, one of the important bases for the Russian Black Sea Fleet. We could not predict or make prognosis on the, or in the development of the bilateral Russian-Ukrainian relations or some other uh, issues. Uh, and uh, after the USSR collapse, uh, Krasnodar uh, uh, region is represented like interesting or particular type of the Russian regions with uh, traditionalism, ideology, sentiments, and uh, maybe it's uh, the most effective region in terms of the uh, development of the process of uh, Cossack survival. Because the uh, idea of Cossack land, primordial Cossack land, became uh, kind of semi-official in Krasnodar region. And this is why uh, many statements of Alexander Tukachev are rather nationalistic. Uh, in comparison with his predecessor, Nikolai Kondratenko, who was rather anti-Semitic, he uh, fought against uh, Zionism uh, conspiracy uh, in Moscow and uh, around. Uh, Tkachev uh, concentrated on the uh, different Caucasian ethnic groups. In the early 2000s, Armenians became target for his criticism, Arme cunning Armenians with their enterprises and, and, and so on and so on, uh, Mesketian Turk, Turks. By the way, in 2004, uh, practically all Mesketian Turks from the Krasnodar region left this territory. It was a unique case when uh, migration was done due to ethnic reasons, not problems of everyday life or some other uh, problems, but uh, in terms of ethnic tensions, ethnic reasons. And uh, um, Kurdish people, and uh, previous year, Alexander Tkachev uh, proposed a rather specific idea uh, to create uh, so-called migration uh, filters against the people from the North Caucasus, forgetting that North Caucasus is not Turkey, it's not Armenia, it's, it's, it's an integral part of the Russian Federation. I think uh, this attempt could be characterized like uh, policy of uh, the Russian separatism. In one of my articles, I propose this term because uh, this idea uh, really promoted uh, answer from the side of ethnic republics. If we uh, are citizens of Russia and could not be, could not live, could not stay in Krasnodar area, what's the sense of uh, what's the sense for us to be citizens of uh, the Russian Federation? I think uh, those attempts uh, could be considered more like destructive for the unity and integrity of the Russian Federation. Uh, but uh, previous year, after his statements on uh, the migration filter, Alexander Tkachev received Chornaya uh, Metka. Black note from the Kremlin, he uh, didn't uh, lead uh, the uh, party list of uh, United Russia for the local parliamentary elections. Let's see. Many, uh, many sources uh, say that uh, Tkachev would be untouchable before the Olympic Games. Let's see after. Because after Olympic Games, another uh, sport uh, holiday is expected, uh, World uh, Cup, Soccer World Cup in 2018. And uh, some uh, cities, Sochi, by the way, would be one of the hosts of this Soccer Cup. Uh, th uh, thus, uh, making a conclusion, uh, the first subtropical winter Olympic Games will require from the Russian authorities not only high quality uh, creativity in public relations, in advertising, but also in uh, enhanced ability to provide security as a high standard. Security and uh, more or less reliable level of inter-ethnic relationship on those territories. Thank you, and uh, now I am ready to uh, receive your questions, comments.
to, to react on your notes, objections. Thank you. Okay, Sergey. Thanks uh, very much. It's a very comprehensive uh, presentation. I wonder if I could offer the uh, th the first question. You alluded to uh, the uh, uh, the Dagestani uh, Vilayat, I think, that had had said it was uh, looking to target the the, so the Sochi Games. Um, how much, uh, to the extent that you are aware of this, I mean, how much uh, chatter among other uh, groups and individuals uh, uh, have expressed the, uh, or are, have identified uh, Sochi as a, as a target, as a specific target for their, for their cause? Okay, good question. Uh, it's not coincidence I paid special attention to the Dagestani Vilayat because till nowadays, by this time of day, only Dagestani Vilayat expressed uh, this uh, opinion to uh, label Sochi as a potential target. But it doesn't mean other uh, groups mm -hmm. or uh, subgroups uh, would not have uh, any ideas to uh, target Sochi. Because uh, for terrorists, uh, maybe it's better to keep secrets, to not discuss the uh, potential scenarios or maybe uh, number of forces uh, for participation in such terrorist attacks. Uh, Dagestan is uh, further to Sochi in comparison with kabardino balkari and karachay Cherkessia. kabardino balkari is... Uh, in my mind, uh, much more important in this context, because for uh, last five, four years, this territory became much more vulnerable in terms of terrorist challenge and dangers. And this situation is uh, brilliantly understood by the uh, leadership of both republics, because from time to time they ask uh, federal government to uh, maybe increase the financial support of those republics to keep uh, more stable and uh, more comfortable. For whom the war is war, for anybody it's kind of interest in business, administrative business, who knows. Okay, let's uh, open the floor to uh, questions and comments. Uh, please just raise your name, raise your hand. Uh, when I call on you, identify yourself, uh, your name, and your uh, affiliation. Yes, over here, Mikhail. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Okay, Mikhail Mamed of Georgetown University. Uh, well, you mentioned several, you concentrated on several points in your presentation. By the way, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. But I watch from time to time Echo of Moscow, its program uh, where main uh, editor-in-chief is Alexei Benediktov. And they keep saying, when they talk about uh, uh, Sochi Olympics, they go from time to time and they keep saying that Russia is not ready for Sochi Olympics. The Sochi Olympics would be major fiasco. So what is it? Is it taken simply out of blue? How do you re how would you react to this? Uh, thank you. And well, the second question is: You mentioned you talked several several times about Greater Cherkessia, but Abkhazia is also a part of Greater Cherkessia. Abkhazians were also Cherkess uh, to a certain point, or maybe the cousins of Cherkess. And when you talk about uh, repatriation. Uh, how would you know about repatriation of Muhajirs? Muhajirs are those people who were forced out by the Russians in 1860. Some of them were forced out from Abkhazia, and when Russians moved, well, Cossacks moved on the north part of Greater Cherkessia, Georgians moved to the south, which be eventually became uh, Abkhazia, became a part of Georgia. What do you know about? Uh, <laughs> repatriation of uh, Abkh Abkhaz, so Cherkessians into Abkhazia. Thank you. Uh, great questions, especially the second one. As for uh, the Echo of Moscow, of course I am observing uh, all Russian media and I got acquainted with the uh, uh, estimates made by Boris Nemtsov. Uh, first, uh, my first uh, estimate. 
I am not going now to criticize Alexei Venediktov or Boris Nemtsov, but in the case of Boris Nemtsov, it's necessary to understand that he is a politician. For politician, uh, the problem of analysis is not uh, the problem. For him, there is another agenda, another methodology, another aims and goals. It's not bad, it's not good. He is politician, I am not politician, I am analyst. When I would be politician, I would behave like Nemtsov, Navalny, or some other persons. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, these uh, choices uh, they are optimal. Uh, of course, I could agree with uh, uh, some points of criticism uh, from uh, Nemtsov side or Echa Moskvi side. Uh, first of all, environment, uh, corruption, uh, maybe violation of uh, human rights and rights of property in Sochi. Of course, of course. But. Uh, this uh, goal is uh, begun realizing. Nowadays, it's impossible to stop this process because losses from this stopping would be more than currently. It's understandable for any policy makers, Putin, Ivanov, Petrov, no matter. As for uh, Circassians and Abkhaz people, uh, you are absolutely right characterizing those relations like relations between cousins, not brothers, not sisters, cousins. Uh, a relationship between Circassians uh, or Circassian movements, it's more correct to say because uh, we have no such uh, judicial faces like Circassians or Abkhaz people, different movements, of course, national movements, and Abkhaz uh, were uh, dependent on many factors. In the early 90s, many Circassians were engaged in the conflict with Georgia on the Abkhaz side. About 3,000 volunteers were engaged. And Circassian groups led by Muayyad Shorov played a significant role in the assault of uh, building of uh, ministry, uh, or building of uh, council of minister controlled by Georgia in Sukhumi. And then uh, Sultan um, Sasnaliev uh, was a minister of defense in Abkhazia and even a vice prime minister. Now uh, he died. But after 2011, uh, we could uh, speak about uh, differences between Abkhazia and uh, some Circassian movements, because you know that Georgia recognized uh, the alleged genocide of Circassians and many Circassians, including guys who fought against Georgians, like Ruslan Keshev, like... Uh, mm -hmm. Ibrahim Yeganov, of course, like Ibrahim Yeganov, uh, supported this decision and uh, they opposed themselves to Abkhaz people. And nowadays, especially in the internet, in uh, social networks, we could see an uh, internet fight, not real fight, between Circassian activists and uh, Abkhaz activists. Uh, because uh, many uh, Circassians proposed uh, Abkhaz people to be more tolerable to Georgians, like Ibrahim Iganov, and, 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 and so on and so on. Uh, it's interesting that in the uh, 90s, uh, the Abkhaz parliament uh, adopted a special law on a repatriation and recognition of uh, genocide in 1997. And uh, Abkhaz government uh, tried from time to time to realize programs on repatriation. The problem of Mahajirs is also so sensitive for Abkhaz people. It's point of consensus. As for Abkhaz people, uh, many of them left Abkhazia in 1966 after the uh, so-called Likhni rebellion. And nowadays, in the territory of Turkey, there were more uh, descendants of ethnic Abkhaz than on territory of Abkhazia. But any programs, any attempts to make repatriation, to realize programs of repatriation of Abkhaz people failed. Because, you know, Abkhazia is a country with uh, suspended sovereignty, with disputed status. It's great. Russia recognized its independence as well as Venezuela or Nicaragua. Uh, but not most of uh, countries of the world, like in the ca case of Kosovo. In terms of uh, poverty or prosperity, 
Abkhazia is incomparable with Turkey, for example. This is why uh, we could uh, name some cases of repatriation. I know uh, even uh, personally some people who repatriated to Abkhazia, but it's limited by maybe dozens, not, not hundreds, not, not thousands. Some of them began uh, business in Abkhazia. Hotel Yesimin, maybe you know if you travel to Abkhazia, Hotel Yesimin belongs to a guy, uh, the Turkish citizen of the Abkhaz background, some business in uh, coal mining and, and so on, but it's, it's very limited. But anyway, anyway nevertheless, uh, Turkey, uh, recognized, uh, uh, recognizing uh, the territorial integrity of Georgia, uh, tries to keep uh, Abkhaz window opened. In 1999, uh, deputy of Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs of Turkey visited Abkhazia, for example, and Sergei Bagapsh, uh, on the eve of his, his death, also visited Turkey, and the Georgian Foreign Ministry protested, and uh, imagine what uh, answer was given by the uh, Turkish uh, Foreign Policy Minister. It's a personal deal of Sergei Bagapsh. We uh, have not informed about, uh, have not been informed about this visit. Uh, looks like a детский сад, kindergarten. But seriously, in terms of realization of uh, national interests. Yes, uh, Steve Benson, CSIS. Sergi, uh, if you look back to Vancouver and then to, to London, where there were arguably uh, pretty good security apparatus and capabilities in place, they still scrambled at the last minute. You had lots of stories about putting capabilities in place and problems for security. Um, enhancing the security in this region and this geography. Um, are they on schedule to do this? Uh, beyond the logistics and the infrastructure and all that, is that going to be in place to, are they considering that up front? Are they working with the, with the folks that did this before to, to make this a, a secure Olympics? In both cases, um, in Vancouver, there was not a, as much uh, in place with regards to keeping track of what moved in and around the region, specifically from an air standpoint. So the land-sea boundaries there, being able to keep track of all the private air, the helicopters, the, the, the yachts that come in, um, everyone who, has a, uh, you know, who is rich and has a means of transportation wants to come in. And, and it saturates the space. Uh, so from a standpoint of just uh, uh, looking at this from a dependent standpoint, they had to put in more capability. But from the London standpoint, there was an issue of uh, indep or, excuse me, I independent standpoint in Vancouver. From a dependent standpoint, uh, it was uh, looking at targets just that they thought, or just looking at uh, 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 looking at the traffic in the area that, so they could keep track of who was there and what was, what was moving around. This was both from actually looking at it from a, a, a radar standpoint and actually looking at it from a transponder standpoint. These kinds of uh, territories with this you know, topography that's canalized and, and difficult to get around, there's a lot of ways to egress and ingress, ingress from the space. So I'm wondering if they're looking at this. Hey, I am not the best person uh, <laughs> who could speak about technical stuff of the security because uh, I concern more on uh, ethno-political dimension of the security. But of course you are absolutely right speaking about vulnerabilities. In the case of Sochi there are many vulnerabilities like uh, access to the sea for example, seashore, it's a kind of potential challenge, or narrow roads. Most of them were built in the period of Stalin, and uh, they are rather vulnerable in terms of traffic jams and, 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 so, and so on. So on. Montana's relief is also dangerous and so on. I know that uh, Russians uh, addressed for consultancy to Israeli specialists, 
By the way, it provoked some tensions in relationship between Georgia and Israel because uh, those guys visited Abkhazia and uh, they were former generals, highest rank uh, generals of the Israeli army, but uh, it's, 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 it's impossible to discuss the uh, issues of the Sochi security with, uh, without Abkhazia. So in, the, in the Soviet time, Sochi Sukhumi was the United, was the single tourist or resort complex. It was considered in this uh, way. I think in terms of security, it's impossible to separate. It's, uh, even if we uh, put aside the problem of Russian-Georgian relations, status of Abkhazia, and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, observing the uh, current tendencies, uh, Russians would uh, secure security based on uh, the Soviet patterns, first of all. Limitation of people who would uh, travel to Sochi, uh, registration, by the way, uh, many people know about specific regime of res registration both in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but there is a regime of registration in uh, Stavropol Krai and Krasnodar Krai. No in my native Rostovskaya Oblast, but in Krasnodar, yes. Uh, when, uh, once upon a time, I traveled to Abkhazia and stopped in Adler. It's the last railway point uh, to the uh, de facto border. And I heard uh, the information in the uh, station. Uh, Господа, у кого нет регистрации в Краснодарском крае, зарегистрируйтесь, пожалуйста. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you uh, have no registration in Краснодар крае, please do it as soon as soon as possible. Uh, this is why, due to those mechanisms, uh, Russians would uh, provide more or less effective control. I, uh, Steve, just a. A couple of times I've raised questions, but they've been in a public or semi-public formats with the U.S. government officials from the State Department and from the National Security Council about, you know, are we working uh, with our Russian colleagues to uh, address the security challenges in Sochi? And the answer is yes, period. That's all I've, that's all I've gotten. Um, yeah, that's a good start. <laughs> Could be good. Anyway, special thanks uh, to Andy for uh, this uh, commentary. Yeah, I, I also heard uh, m more positive estimates from the Russian side on this cooperation. Because uh, usually uh, United States of America represent their most numerous delegations for all Olympics. Sochi would not be accepted, and this is why there is a special concern. For U.S.-American cooperation, there is another thing, another uh, topic, deficit of uh, pragmatism. Because we continue to uh, discuss tactics with ideological stamps, like resovitization and, 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 and so on and so on. Put them aside. Let's discuss real interests and uh, mutual benefits. It's much more productive, I think, for both sides. Not Magnitsky law, Dima Yakovlev law, or some other things. They are not so important for their uh, mutual relations. Um, Elasso and Freedom House. Uh, Sergey, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, I have two questions, actually. Um, in the list of the potential uh, security obstacles listed, uh, terrorist threat from the underground, militant underground, is very real which also imply that the competence or the ability to deter this terrorist threat by the security services may be limited. Should the competence of security services also be a consideration of, you know, as a security concern uh, with respect to Sochi Olympics? That's one question. And second question is, uh, in light of the recent what some call political cleansing of the political elite in Dagestan, starting with the arrest of Saeed Amirov and all the corruption cases that have uh, emerged since then. Do you believe that maybe some connection to preparing and ensuring uh, some security or changing the political dynamic in Dagestan to provide a better security uh, before the Olympics? Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, be brief uh, on the first question. Of course, yes. Of course, and because uh, when uh, corporate interests violate or dominate or violate interest of the state, it's, it's a danger in any way, in, in every, every cases, American, Russian, and, and so on. 
I, I think cooperation or strict coordination is required. Uh, if you uh, would be interested to uh, raise your chances. As the second question, uh, first of all, I'm not sure that uh, now we could make any conclusions about the uh, real changes of the Russian attitude to Dagestan. Saini Tamirov uh, was kind of symbol who was uh, the most visible or clear you know that Dagestan maybe is the only constituency, not only in the Caucasus, but generally in Russian Federation, without vertical and with real freedom of press. Not due to democracy, but due to different groups controlling different uh, mass media. This is why it's uh, really uh, admiration or satisfaction to read uh, Dagestani newspapers, Chernovik and so on. You could agree, you could disagree, but the level of estimate is really different from uh, the thought general topics of the regional uh, mass media. The first topic is love to Vladimir Putin, the second topic is love to the regional president or uh, governor, and third topic of uh, media interesting about animals, about zoos, about uh, theaters, and uh, some other blah, blah. But in uh, the case of Dagestan, it was a uh, real, really interesting content. But don't forget that uh, mayor of uh, any other cities of Dagestan are real uh, policy makers. What's about Said Pasha Omakhanov? I'm not sure that resources of Said Pasha Omakhanov, mayor of Hasavyurt, are really less or weaker than resources of Said Amirov. What's about resources of uh, Imam Yeralif, mayor of Derbent, gateway of Russia to the South Caucasus? Huge resources. Amirov is kind of symbol. Uh, symbol uh, in terms of PR, first of all, because uh, the federal government tries to demonstrate it. Please see, please uh, be afraid of Ramazan Abdulatipov. He is a very strong guy, he, he can. He could, he should, and, and, and so on. But in, in reality, I don't see uh, real prerequisites for changes. Till nowadays, uh, and of course, uh, Russia criticized or representatives of uh, Russian officials or some guys who are close to the federal authorities uh, criticized uh, Said Amirov. Oh, he is bandit, he is a gangster, and so on, so on. But uh, why uh, did you keep silence, guys, in 1999? when Said Amirov secured real military help to the federal troops against Basayev and Khatab. Why did you keep silence when Said Amirov secured results for United Russia, minimizing chances of communists, which were very strong, by the way, in Dagestan? And I think in Dagestan, communists are very required because it was the only secular force, including different ethnicities of Dagestan. Communists are very, very uh, valuable in Dagestan. It was in another way a social protest uh, would be privatized by radical Muslims. And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because the uh, situation in Dagestan was formed as a result of deficit of the federal presence, especially after the uh, formation of Chechen Republic of Echkeria. You know that uh, Dagestan was practically cut from the rest of Russia. And of course, clans, informal ties uh, began playing a uh, more important, sometimes key role. But it's not only a uh, responsibility of Said Amira for guys who were closer to him. And the uh, most important question, uh, what kind of model could replace the model of Amirov or Amirovs around Dagestan? It's, the, uh, it's uh, an inevitable question. The most important thing. What effective model would replace this? The, of course, I, I recognize this model is not so good. It's uh, ineffective. It's privatization of republic. What's instead? Are you ready to propose real things? Not only one demonstrative step like arrest of Said Amirov, but real changes. I'm not sure. Competency and security services, the first question. Yeah, I, uh, okay. yeah, I answered. Okay. It's, it's, it's a challenge, yes. Um, okay. I mean, let me make a comment. I can't help but this, but because it also ties, ties in with the U.S. US American, U.S.-Russian relationship. You know, I think the, there are so many questions about uh, the experience of uh, Tamerlan Tsarnaev 
and the Sarnayev brothers. And uh, I mean, obviously, it was a um, <clears throat> a security, a massive security failure on the part, on our part, on the U.S. on the U.S. part. Um, but uh, there are an awful lot of questions about uh, what uh, Russian security services were doing or not doing uh, when Tamerlan Sarnayev returned to Dagestan and to Russia for the six, seven months uh, in the first half of, uh, of 2000, 2012. And I mean, if we're be to believe the reports that have come out from uh, Novaya Gazeta uh, and other, other Russian, Russian sources, uh, there's fairly clear evidence that Tamerlan Sinayev was engaged in, in meetings uh, and in activities which should have certainly been of concern to Russian local and federal intelligence uh, uh, services who had alerted us, who had alerted the U.S. the previous year about their concern about the, the radicalization of Tamerlan. Tamerlan, Tamerlan. I believe the reports that have come out from uh, Novaya Gazeta uh, and other other Russian Russian sources. Uh, there's fairly clear evidence that Tamerlan Sinayev was engaged in in meetings uh, and and activities which should have certainly been of concern to Russian local and federal intelligence uh, uh, services who had alerted us, who had alerted the U.S. the previous year about their concern about the, the radicalization of Tamerlan, Tamerlan, Tamerlan Tsarnaev. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, I guess the good, the good news is that this experience uh, has led to some uh, well, led to the awareness on the U.S. and Russian government that uh, our, the inadequacies of our cooperation on intelligence sharing and, and uh, uh, about, about that. But, um, I mean, the, the, comp the competency of, it doesn't look like a, a sterling hour for the competency of, of uh, intelligence services on, on, on either side, um, for sure. I guess I'll leave it at that. Maybe there'll be some other commentary further. In your case, Andy, the problem is uh, confidence and trust. It's, it's, it's a other deficit. Deficit of pragmatism, but deficit of trust. Well, no, I, I think there were, there were other problems on the, on the, well, there were serious procedural and bureaucratic problems on the U.S. on the U.S. side, leading to sort of the oversight of, of Tom, Tomerlin, Tomerlin Sinaev. The distrust issue is certainly a, a big piece of it and why it makes, why intelligence sharing is so, is so hard anyway, even with, even with close allies. Uh, because of concern yeah. about uh, revelation of sources and, 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 all, and all that. Yeah. I do, um, Michael Hodge from the State Department. Uh, just a couple quick questions. Uh, first one specifically to, can you talk about the uh, or, uh, organized crime element in Sochi and a relationship with the host organizing committee and senior officials? And the second question is, um, in this region specifically, but uh, you know, they've recently hosted the uh, Asia Pacific Economic Conference. They have the Winter Games. They have the World Cup coming up as well after um, Brasilia. They're going to have G8 following the Olympics. Uh, they have the Kazan Games going on right now. So what what's changed to move such international events in such a small time frame? If you understand what I'm trying to say. From what, uh, since what time do we analyze uh, the changes? I don't, I don't, uh, I don't uh, see any real change. But with, with, with what, what, what period? Well, the APEC conference was just last a few years ago. Um, no, APEC, APEC was last year. For, for that one for Sochi. No, Vladivostok. Sorry. Yeah, APEC Vladivostok. was held in Vladivostok in the Russian Far East. It's far, it's, it's far east. It's, it's about 4,000 kilometers from uh, Krasnodar. But anyway, of course, you are absolutely right that the influence of uh, organized crime or corruption or informal ties in the business around uh, such objects like Olympic objects or objects for forum, of course, they exist. I don't think that uh, we could really uh, make conclusions on uh, radical degrees of them real changes? Well, 
One difference is that Russia is much more wealthier than it was in the 1990s, for sure. I mean, ho holding major events like the Olympics or the World Cup are very, very, very expensive. expensive. So consider, for, for Russia, to, Russia was not really realistic for Russia to consider doing that uh, at, the end of the at the end of the 1980s and throughout through the 1990s. And I think it's no coincidence that you know Russia effectively became solvent. They paid off their uh, their Paris Club debt. They'd paid off their IMF debt the year previously in 2005 and 2006. That 2007 was you know they then they go they go international and uh, get this big prize for uh, for Sochi. So just simply the, the the wealth factor of the country is is important for things like you know APEC or or G8. That's those are, those are they're different things that are driving them. I mean, holding the holding APEC for Russia was that was you know Russia's effort to make its uh, sort of symbolizing its own Asia pivot, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia host, hosting the G8 uh, back in 2006 for the first time, and now in 2014 again in uh, in, in Sochi. in Sochi. You know, this is a well. 2006 was very sim symbolic because this again you know represented Russia's uh, you know. Membership, if not quite full membership, in the in the G8, the first time that it was that it was hosting it, so it held a lot of uh, you know I think political political significance. Uh, I would like to ask about demographic challenge, uh, Armenians as demographic challenge for uh, Abkhazia and for particular from. Uh, how do you think? How uh, it will influence on Sochi Olympic Games and uh, what is the place of uh, this game uh, for um, the Armenian population in Krasnodar Krai and uh, the, the authority in Krasnodar Krai, their position concerning to Armenians. What do you think about that? Thank you, Tigran. First of all, uh, let me make one uh, methodological uh, distinction. Uh, two other ca two different cases in principle, because uh, in Krasnodar Krai, the ethnic majority, Russian majority, is about 85, 84, 85%. In the case of uh, Abkhazia, the number of Armenians is uh, practically equal to the number of Abkhaz people. Uh, even if uh, we would follow the official data, official statistics of the de facto authorities. And the problem of Armenian community is uh, not related uh, directly with uh, Sochi. Uh, but uh, this problem is crucially important for the national building of Abkhazia and uh, perspective of Abkhazia. Because uh, you know that uh, nowadays uh, Abkhazia uh, tends to combine principles of ethnocracy and multi-ethnicity. On the one side, uh, any representatives of Abkhazia try to uh, demonstrate uh, their uh, benevolence to multi-ethnicity. They try to stress uh, in the period of 1992-1993, Armenians, Russians, Greeks, Jewish people fought with us against Georgian invasion, aggression, and so on, so on, so on. But uh, at the same time, let's see on the number of Armenians in the government or in the parliament. In the parliament of Abkhazia, there are only three Armenians. Three Armenians, no more. Uh, but uh, we uh, know about uh, active engagement of Armenians in the war on the Abkhaz side. Battalion Bagramiana, Bagramian Battalion, and uh, engagement of such persons like uh, Galus Trapizanyan and uh, Sergei Matevasyan and some, some other persons. Uh, it was uh, very, very important for Abkhazia. But at the same time, we have uh, underrepresentation of Armenians in the structures. But at the same time, in the uh, sphere of business, Armenians are very active in terms of tourism business, private driving from the Russian side to Abkhazia. Personally, I prefer to cross the border through so-called Tarmyansky Dvorik in Adler, in Blinova district. It was cheaper and faster. For extra 100 rubles, you would save a couple of hours of expecting on the border. 
It's it's uh, and uh, private excursions made by Armenians are also cheaper inside Abkhazia, and in terms of quality, uh, I prefer to those excursions. I don't uh, have uh, anything against Abkhaz people, but anyway, this is why it's a real problem. By the way, as a um, uh, situation in Gali district uh, inhabited by uh, Migrarians or Georgians, uh, this number is about 45 or 50,000 people. The problem of their integration is also very important. The problem of citizenship, or obtaining citizenship for them, is very important. And you know that uh, uh, Abkhaz Constitution, Article 49, strictly prohibits for all uh, minorities, non-Abkhaz people, to be elected as a president of Abkhazia. This is why it's a problematic. Okay, I've got uh, three uh, questions from the back row. <clears throat> uh, thank you for your presentation, Alexander Melikishvili, IHS Global Insight. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one has to do with the, um, uh, your perspective on the uh, Russian-Georgian Corp security cooperation in the run-up to Sochi Olympics. As you probably know, uh, Prime Minister Ivanishvili made a um, statement in this regard, uh, promising full cooperation with regard to security of the upcoming Games, and made a rather controversial decision about Georgia's participation in the Olympic Games. It seems like uh, Georgia will be sending a delegation to the uh, Sochi Olympics. And the second question uh, has to do with uh, your take on uh, um, Bilalov's dismissal and the whole controversy surrounding uh, that uh, uh, in the context of the preparations for the Sochi Olympics. Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, start briefly from the second question about Bilalov. Bilalov played a role of uh, symbol like PR victim. Let's guys see we could uh, dismiss any guys uh, engaged in corruption and, and, and so on and so on. I am not sure that problem of uh, Sochi development or Sochi business is restricted by uh, the personality of uh, such a distinguished guy like Belalov. Uh, as for uh, the Russian-Georgian uh, security cooperation, uh, thank you for this question. A uh, couple of years ago, maybe uh, this question uh, would be perceived like paradox or inadequate question, but uh, uh, I raised it uh, even after the Five Days War, but in a little bit uh, different context. I am absolutely sure that this cooperation would be, and uh, it's inevitable, in the context of the North Caucasus. Because Georgia and Russia share Dagestani, Chechen, and Ingush uh, parts of the border. And this problem is not a problem of uh, only Russia. You uh, remember brilliantly the uh, recent experience of Lapota Gorge, and previous experience of Pankisi Gorge. It's very dangerous. Many people in Georgia uh, dreamed and uh, dream now uh, Russia would leave the North Caucasus. I think it would be a nightmare for Georgia. Because uh, Russia could uh, go to Siberia or Ural, uh, Far East, but uh, Georgia has no Siberia, Ural, Far East, and, and so on. It would face real problems. And I think uh, this context would make our countries uh, closer. As for Sochi security cooperation, maybe, but here I am more skeptical. But in the uh, North Caucasus, eastern part of the North Caucasus uh, from the Russian side, yeah, it's uh, potentially possible. It would help, by the way, to promote uh, normalization of the countries taking aside the status issues of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Toby Davis, U.S. Department of State. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, if Russia gets through the Sochi Olympics without any major incident, uh, what do you predict relations will be like between Russia and the North Caucasus Republics, Georgia, uh, Abkhazia region, and then um, on the other side, if there is some incident, how do you think those relations will change? Thank you. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, of, of course I want to be optimist, of course, but be, being an expert, I could not be optimist extremely. It, it's, it's necessary to be uh, more or less pessimistic uh, to, 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 to be an expert. In, what's, in, 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 what's, what's the over-under in Vegas? On in, in, in another way, I would, be I, would be, I would be a politician, especially European politicians who uh, believe in progress. Bosnia progress, Kosovo progress, Georgia progress, e everywhere progress. But I'm not European politician, I am an expert with a Russian background, this is why I need to be more pessimistic uh, or, 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 or realistic. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that uh, Sochi would uh, dramatically change the Russian attitude to the uh, Caucasus or to Georgia. Uh, maybe if those incidents uh, would be directly connected with Georgian engagement or Abkhaz engagement, yes. If no, uh, I, I don't think uh, that Russia would make something new in terms of uh, struggle against terrorism or normalization with Georgia in order to have uh, more chances to effectively struggle against terrorism and, 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 and so on. This is why, uh, of course, uh, I, I want uh, that uh, Sochi Olympics would be with uh, no incidents. I have many uh, criticism to uh, Vladimir Putin, to the Russian government, but at the same time, I'm not Vladimir Ilyich Lenin and Bolshevik, who really wished the defeat of uh, their own national government in World War I. We know the results of these uh, desires. This is why I, uh, I am not champion of this approach. And it's uh, sad for me that uh, many competitors of mine try to behave like Bolsheviks. That's an interesting question, Toby. Um, depend, upon, depend upon the incident and uh, the extent to which we knew from where the incident was, was perpetrated or who were, the, who, who were the perpetrators. But boy, I think this would be extremely inflammatory for, for Russian public opinion. Um, and for personally, for for Putin, uh, uh, would be a he would take it very, very, very badly. Um, this, uh, I mean, this really is a. There's a lot of symbolic value in this in this event. So, um, of course, I agree with uh, with Sergey. Uh, and let's. But n n nevertheless, I uh, don't. Uh, I could not imagine right now that uh, Russia, after some incidents, yeah. if they would be, would uh, provide carpet bombarding of uh, the North Caucasus or so, so, so on. Even understanding the symbolic importance of this event for Vladimir Putin and the Russian government. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation, Ulvi Smail, um, independent consultant. Um, you mentioned, uh, you started your presentation with um, what happened in 79 and subsequent 1988 um, Olympic Games in Soviet Union um, with, you know, Soviet Union's intervention in Afghanistan and, and the boycott from the West. Um, well, today we, we have Syria issue, which um, as recent G20 summit showed, um, disagreements between uh, President Putin and, and President Obama, the uh, pictures around and, and Russian media still today writes about victory of Russia on this issue. Um, do you think that um, as it, the history can repeat itself as, as you know, a few years ago, uh, something like that in which is a security issue beyond Russia's border or USSR border, not, not within, but toppled with Russia's um, human rights issues that has been criticized um, recently um, <coughs> be it, you know, the, the recent protests and, and, and arrests, the Pussy Riot case and Khodorkovsky and other cases uh, can be, ca you know, causing to, again, uh, you know, boycott of the Olympics by by the Western countries. And would you think then it is, would be considered as kind of, you know, jealousy or skepticism of the West on fair treatment of the Russia by the West? And do you think Russia in this case is much different from China, for example, who hosted Beijing Olympics 2008. So uh, what's your take on that? Thank you so much. Interesting question, and maybe it takes to write a special monograph about it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a very important thing. Uh, I think uh, you raise, uh, oh, you, you uh, draw our attention to the differences between the USSR and uh, contemporary Russia. I'm repeating once again, uh, 
tensions and bilateral problems in relationship between the West, United States, and European Union and Russia are not ideological. They are based more on business, on pragmatism. Many people from Georgia like to repeat, let's see 2,000 soldiers from Georgia serve in Afghanistan. Great, of course, but 4,500 flights annually from the West to Afghanistan are provided through so-called Northern Corridor through Russia. Russia is not a member of NATO. And it's official information represented by the uh, Department of State. This is why I think uh, there are many uh, common points in terms of business, in terms of security. And Syria, I don't think that it's a problem of clash or uh, differences between President Obama and President Vladimir Putin. I think President Navalny, or even Prokhorov, by the way, who was rather critical to the Western approach to Syria, would provide practically the same policy, maybe with noisy anti-American rhetoric addressed first and foremost to the domestic audience. Maybe. As for uh, me personally, I am against this noisy uh, anti-American rhetoric. It's not pragmatic. I'm for pragmatism. But it doesn't mean that uh, Syria is a case of uh, dictatorship, solidarity, and so on. Don't forget that uh, Russia has a substantial uh, Muslim uh, minority, very substantial. In seven constituencies, Muslims are the dominant groups, ethnic Muslims. And a turmoil around Russia and influence from the Middle East to Russia is a concern. Secular Syrian regime supported Russia in Chechnya, supported Russia in uh, Georgia, and, and so on. But if we would imagine they overthrew and maybe collapse of uh, power in Syria, or split of the country, or victory of radical Muslims. It's not theories, because we see some negative results of so-called Arab Spring in uh, Egypt and... Go ahead, we sort of... Yeah, and, 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 and so on and so on. This is why uh, I don't think uh, that uh, the West would repeat the uh, approach of 1979-1980 uh, to uh, Russia today. Because one principal difference, no Russian troops in Syria. If they would be deployed there, let's come back to this discussion. But I'm not sure that they would be really deployed. Mikhail Leontiev or some other journalists could discuss it for the uh, TV watchers, for, for the Russian audience. But I'm not sure that Vladimir Putin would seriously take it into, into account. Let me give you a little personal response. Um, I remember very well the boycott of the 1980 Olympics. I hated that decision. I thought that was a terrible decision on the part of the, the Carter administration and other European governments that followed it. Why? Because basically who was punished were the athletes. The athletes who would compete. At the time, I was a track athlete. I was a 400 meter runner. I was not a world class runner, but I was a national class runner. I was a pretty fast white guy. And I ran against a lot of guys that would have competed in those Olymp Olympics and, sometime, and sometimes trained, trained with them. And to lose that opportunity, for some people, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. One of the greatest track athletes ever, Ronaldo Nehemiah. Uh, who held the world record in the 110 high, high hurdles. Didn't run in that, that and, and never ran again because he started playing, started playing pro football. I just thought it was a, a terrible decision uh, to, to even further politicize Olymp the Olympic Games, which are already overly politicized in, in, in my view. Um, so I would, be, I would be violently opposed to any boycott of the Games. But there are some people that you'll, you'll hear some voices calling for a boycott of the games because the Russians doing this and the, Rus the, Rus the Russians doing that. And if things, something uh, very bad happened in the U.S.-Russia relation from the perspective of, of the U.S., you would hear those, voice, those voices more. But I think the only reason that, the only justifiable reason to, to, uh, to not to boycott Olympic games, but we'd, we'd cancel, uh, cancel Olympic games because of, of, uh, of a of a very, very, very imminent uh, security risk, that um, which is not unimaginable, but not the most likely thing to happen. Okay, sorry, I had to, just had to say that. I was very, very angry. 
And I still am about it. It was uh, 30, 32 years later. It was very interesting answer because I also I, I was a student that time, but I uh, brilliantly remember the situation around and uh, in uh, f for the Olympic Games in Lake Placid, I was especially impressed by Eric Hayden, who was a skate uh, runner who uh, won five gold medals. I was really impressed and I, I, I supported him putting aside Cold War and some anti-American sentiments and so on. And I, I remember his interview to the Soviet newspapers when he uh, reproduced practically the same argument that Andy uh, do now, that does now. But I don't suppose you were rooting for that American hockey team in 1980, were you? <laughs> <laughs> I cried. You know, also, also one, one, I'm sure, just like I cried when the, uh, the United States lost in basketball in 1972 in Munich. Uh, but the other thing uh, is that, I mean, what, okay, you've got, you've got this international venue, and it's, you know, uh, so let the athletes compete. Uh, I mean, let the American athletes go to, go to, go to Moscow or go to, go to Sochi, and, uh, okay, you got the point. All right, uh, I think we have time for, uh, well, we're running out of time. If someone's got a, a question or comment, they absolutely feel, feel necessary. Okay, you've got it. Last one, right here. Evgenia Tajirian, independent analyst. Sergey, thank you very much for your, for your great presentation. Just to finalize, uh, if you can give some kind of suggestion or advice to the Russian government, if you can just draw some kind of conclusion, what would you do or what you would change to make uh, Sochi Olympics more secure and more successful? Thank you. <laughs> If I would be brief, um, I could give uh, such suggestions. First of all, be more sophisticated. Be more careful. Be more pragmatic. <laughs> For okay. such money, snow would be. <laughs> right. $50 billion, you think they could get some snow there. Yeah. Um, and counting. Uh, I, I would follow up on, on a line that, uh, I would be consulting with those that were responsible for previous Olympic Games, the Vancouver Games, the London Games, the, Be the Beijing Games, and, uh, and this would be going on quietly and behind closed doors uh, to just try to bring every means uh, possible uh, from a technical and logistical security standpoint to ensure the safety of the, of the Games. Um, as, a last, as a last point, since I want to wish success once again, not, uh, not because this will be a, a feather in the hat of Vladimir Putin, but just because I, you want to see a successful Olympic Games and what the Olympic spirit and movement is all, is all about. Um, you know, there was an Olympic Games uh, in which uh, at the time there was not a major uh, resort at this area which developed into one of the, the premier largest ski resorts in the world. And that happens to be Squaw Valley, 1960, California. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and this is right around Lake Tahoe, similar to in the Sierra Nevada mountains, similar to uh, the region around Sochi, the combination of this beautiful water, Lake Tahoe and the mountains, but it had not snowed at all. And literally, there was a serious there was a serious problem because they didn't have the kind of snow making equipment that they have they have now. And thank God, about a day or two before the Olympics, uh, it did snow and the games came off successfully. And it was it put Squaw Valley and the Sierra Nevada and the Lake Tahoe region on the map as a major major ski resort and destination. So I hope that uh, that Sochi uh, has the same impact for uh, for the Caucasus as a world class ski resort and destination. Uh, for Russia. Sergey, thanks for a terrific presentation. And uh, as always, and thank you for coming and providing very thoughtful comments and questions. <laughs>